All right. Just doing a little sound check here. So, hello. Can you hear me? Everyone can hear me. Hopefully, yes. We're, we're starting this uh, right now in just about one minute or so, just waiting for one more of our speakers. But I think he can sneak in while I do this introduction. So, uh, with this very, very warm welcome to the official launch of the first ever Nordic Voluntary Subnational Review. And uh, this is a report about the Nordic municipality's efforts to implement the SDGs. What works? What worries them? How can we uh, benefit and promote, use the SDGs to promote life quality for people and avoid political polarization and promote sustainable development for all? These are some of the questions we'll discuss here today. Uh, my name is Åsa Ström Hildestrand. I work for Nordregio, or the Nordic Council of Ministers, our Nordic uh, governmental collaboration. Uh, and I'm your moderator today, as you might have guessed. We have a few more guests coming in. You're all very welcome. Please take a seat. Um, I will be tough on the timekeeping, because we have many distinguished speakers in this room, as you can see. And we have only one hour and 15 minutes. But I will try and make sure that there is room for some questions uh, uh, that you can pose in the end. Um, we will start out with the opening words by our prominent uh, national representatives here today. And then, uh, of course, hear about key results and learnings from the Nordic municipalities. Then we'll dive into the Nordic toolbox for local practices that you can get inspired by. And finally, we have commentaries from our international partners and from our Nordic youth delegates over here. And then we'll open the floor for questions. I also wanted to highlight that this side event is co-hosted by us at Nordregio, Nordic Council of Ministers, together with all the five Nordic countries. So we have Sweden, Denmark, Iceland, Norway, and Finland and their local and regional government associations. So that's the group that has also been creating this Nordic VSR, and in close collaboration also with UN Habitat and UCLG. So we really appreciate that. Again, very, very warm welcome to all of you here in the room and also the audience online. And I'll look here for the camera or there. So we have several cameras in the room for good to know for you as speakers as well. Uh, we will share this uh, recording also afterwards together with the link to the report. But it's also available in the little folder that you have on your table or on your chair. So with that, without more further ado, I'll leave the floor to our first opening speaker, Ms. Anna-Karin Enström, permanent representative of Sweden to the UN and also actually chairing the Nordic collaboration this year. Welcome, and the floor is yours. Thank you uh, so much, uh, Osa, and, uh, and to all of you uh, participants uh, uh, here in the room and online. I'm very happy to be here with you. Hope very much for a good, uh, for a good discussion, and we are really thrilled to co-host this uh, side event with, uh, with collaboration with our Nordic uh, colleagues uh, in countries, along with the local and regional government associations in our, in our nations and the UN Habitat and UCLG. The Nordic Voluntary Subnational Review is the first of its kind. It has been accomplished with the support of Nordregio, as we heard, and the Nordic Council of uh, Ministers. The Nordic Council of Ministers is the official organization for the uh, intergovernmental cooperation in the Nordic uh, region, this year chaired by Sweden. It seeks to encourage Nordic solutions and peer learning whenever the countries can achieve more together than individually. And I can just witness about the really, really close and good cooperation between the Nordic countries here in New York. I think it's one of the places in the world where we have the the tightest and, and best uh, collaboration between the Nordic countries. So I just wanted that as a side, side comment. Uh, uh, by 2030, the Nordic uh, region aims to be the most sustainable and integrated 
region in the world. Uh, this Vision uh, 2030 comes with a plan of, of action for joint efforts to promote sustainability and integration. There is a clear connection between the Nordic Vision 2030 and the 2030 Agenda. The solutions to our global challenges are not only international and national, but also regional and locally, local. Achieving the SDG is, require contributions from, from all levels of societies. The Nordic countries operate under a decentralized welfare, uh, welfare model where regions and municipalities have extensive responsibilities based on strong local self-government. Uh, we also have a long tradition of robust relations between the different levels of government supported by national agencies that produce reliable statistics in many areas. This creates favorable conditions for working towards sustainable development. As this new Nordic uh, VSR show, shows, the, the local level is taking the lead in advancing sustainability and transforming society by integrating the SDGs in steering models and utilizing them as tools to spur cross-sectoral collaboration and enhance quality of life for citizens. As we are preparing for both the Summit of the Future and the fourth international conference on financing for development, we hope that this event will be an opportunity to discuss uh, lessons learned from the SDG localization and how this can help uh, turbocharge sustainable development. We look forward to the coming discussion here today and listen to your insights and experiences. And with that, I thank you very much. Uh, back to you, Osa. Thank you so much, Anna Karin. And uh, with that, over to our Norwegian colleague, Merete Fjell Brattested. You're the permanent representative of Norway to the United Nations. We're so happy to have you here today as well. I think the it works. And now yeah. it's on. Thank you so much. I'm really happy to be here and to follow uh, on naturally what uh, Anna Karin was saying. Um, we know, of course, that implementation of the Sustainable Development Goals is a shared responsibility, which requires us to work across sectors and through international cooperation. And in this case, through Nordic cooperation. Nordic cooperation has deep roots and traditions in our shared history, our values, our economies, our languages, and our culture. And Nordic cooperation originates from geography, but today it represents our common identity. The decentralized Nordic welfare states, uh, as also Anna Karin pointed to, are characterized by substantial autonomy and decision-making capabilities in municipalities and regions. We think this can serve as a benchmark for systematically addressing sustainable, uh, sustainability challenges. In Norway, the national, local, and regional governments are deeply committed to and involved in implementing the SDGs. But we know that to achieve the ambitions of the 2030 Agenda, a broad range of actors must be included to create more inclusive, sustainable communities. In this Nordic uh, sub-national review, messages from youth and civil society organizations are included. These are valuable contributions, underlining the importance of including a broad range of actors and to ensure me meaningful collaboration in the local SDG work. So I'm looking forward to this launch of the Nordic VSR and to hear the different Nordic experiences and achievements. Thank you, and back to you. Thank you, thank you, Mariette. And then over to Finland. And Eva Furman, your Secretary General of the Finnish National Commission on Sustainable Development. And that has actually existed all the way back since 1993. And that tells us something about the, the history of commitment to sustainability work in the Nordic countries. Eva, we're so happy to have you here with us today. I'm very happy to be here and meet you all. And this sounds like a Eurovision competition. <laughs> So, dear participants and, and Nordic colleagues, 
the importance of localization of the SDGs is gaining uh, uh, growing attention. And this is uh, both required as well as well deserved, I think. To build an unbroken link from local to global and vice versa, stepping stones are needed. And here, the multi level governance steps uh, in and the process behind, for example, the report that we are now discussing is one part of it. In big uh, and sparsely populated countries like the Nordic ones, multilevel governance is necessity in fostering sustainable development. It signals the national sustainability ambitions to local level, and it also brings the local innovations into national policy making. In Finland, the Commission of Sustainable Development brings together actors from local to national level, and it also offers a platform for dialogue to foster paradigm change in uh, how to ensure planetary well-being. So much needed. More ad hoc, our government collaborates with regions, with countryside and villages, newly established uh, well-being um, regions, as well as the Sami indigenous peoples and their sustainable development questions on land, for example. And Oland Island is part of Finland and now came with their own VNR. We have been collaborating there as well. And during the last few, four years, Finland's national program supported municipalities to twin with each other on sustainability planning, budgeting and management. However, this is not easy and there is plenty to learn. And that's why this Nordic collaboration and today's report has been so important to us and brought uh, Finland some international reflection. So I've also very much look forward to the inspired exchange of novel ideas on how multilevel collaboration could enhance up, uh, speeding up the implementation of the Agenda 2030. Thank you. For Eger Oskarsson, Deputy Permanent Representative of Iceland to the UN. And you uh, took the stage quite, quite broadly here last year, because then you presented your voluntary national review. And we're very happy to have you here today as well. The floor is yours. Thank you, Madam Moderator. And I'm not sure that Eurovision is the best example of Nordic cooperation. <laughs> but that's another story. Good afternoon, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here today with all of you to celebrate the excellent product of Nordic Cooperation. As my Nordic colleagues have also mentioned, Nordic Cooperation is extremely valuable to us and gave us an opportunity to push ourselves and draw inspiration. By sharing experiences and knowledge, best practices and lessons learned, we all benefit and hopefully that way we can further accelerate progress for the SDGs. We are faced with a stark reality of the slow progress towards our collective goals worldwide. According to this year's Sustainable Development Report, only 16% of the SDG targets are on track to be met globally by 2030. It is therefore important that we use the opportunity the upcoming Summit of the Future brings us to take a close look at how we intend to enhance our efforts. Sorry, I went the wrong way. And it needs to be a team effort with various stakeholders working together. I keep to the text now. The Icelandic Prime Minister's Office, which spearheads Iceland's work on the SDGs, decided at the very start of the implementation process to include association of local authorities in the governmental steering group that was established to coordinate the Iceland's work on the Agenda 2030. It turned out to be a wise decision because the cooperation has been fruitful and a good example of a successful multi-level governance. Iceland presented its second voluntary national review at the HLPF last year. And in the multi-stakeholder spirit of the Agenda 2030, the report included chapters written by several stakeholders, including one from the Association of Local Authorities. 
I look forward, as my colleagues, to hear more about the good practices, results, and key learnings, and especially welcome the youth representative that are joining us here today on this occasion. Thank you so much. And then, last but not least, over to Denmark and Eric Larsson. You're also the Deputy Permanent Representative of Denmark to the United Nations. Very welcome here today. Thank you so much, Madam Moderator. Very fitting, uh, Denmark last. That's how, usually how it goes in the Eurovision. <laughs> uh, but thanks, uh, thanks, and congratulations to Nord Radio and, and the Nordic Association of, of Local and Regional Governments uh, on the official launch uh, of the first ever Nordic uh, voluntary sub-national uh, um, review. Really excellent. Indeed, the 2030 agenda is the most ambitious global uh, action um, agenda and for sustainable development that we have ever adopted uh, in, in the UN. Um, and, and therefore, very, very important to see how we implement also both at the global here in, in, in New York and to, through the UN, uh, to the leadership, hopefully, that we can, um, that we can sustain and, and through local action. And, and this is something that, is, in fact, we understand that about two thirds of the SDD uh, 169 targets can only be achieved through local and, and regional uh, action. And, and this, in, in in, in our opinion, really highlights the importance of sub-national engagement in the implementation of, of the SDG targets. Cities, regions, municipalities really have a unique opportunity to translate the SDGs into, into concrete action at the local level because, of course, uh, these institutions are closer um, to, to the inhabitants and to companies in, in included. And, and this, as some of, uh, of my colleagues have already um, highlighted, this is particularly important and, 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 and very much the case in, in the Nordic countries where the public sector is indeed highly decentralized. Um, this was mentioned already, and I, I think very much the case also in Denmark. I would just just provide you with one example of how how we have gone forward in in, in Denmark when and through what we call the Climate Alliance. In Denmark, we have 98 uh, municipalities, um, and they are organised through Kommunernes Landsforening, uh, which is the local government association of Denmark, and and through this organisation, there is targeted support to municipalities, which can then develop and implement climate action plans through this unique partnership called the Climate Alliance, and and this alliance provides the the, the Danish municipalities and and regions the opportunity to coordinate uh, climate efforts and develop strategic and, and cross-cutting climate initiatives. So collaboration is very much on the agenda here. Knowledge sharing is on the agenda, and hopefully this can support the climate neutral and climate resilient uh, uh, future by, by that we, we, we aim to reach by latest 2050. So we look forward very much to the today's presentation of the results and to the learnings um, and, and, uh, and to the discussion that we will have today. And uh, thank you for giving us this opportunity to participate. Thank you. It's actually really something that we have highlighted in the report, this climate alliance. Denmark is the only country where all uh, the municipalities are now aligned on this climate planning action and where everyone, all the municipalities now have a climate action plan. So that's interesting for anyone who wants to learn more. Talk to Eric and his team. Uh, another... Uh, country, or not real country, but a self-governing territory within Finland, as Eva already mentioned, is Åland. And uh, they could not be here today, but this is just a little promotion for their first voluntary review. And it turns out that Åland Islands have a very ambitious agenda for sustainable development. They've localized the goals into seven sub-goals for Åland and action plans for each of the goals. And they have a very strong vision that says, exactly as the title here, everyone can flourish on the islands of peace. So uh, that's a message uh, from Åland to all of us here today uh, for peace and sustainability and collaboration. Uh, they also have a fantastic uh, setup of networks of stakeholder engagement, etc. So this, this review can be downloaded on the High Level Political Forum website as well. So check out Åland Voluntary Review 2024. 
All right, with that, let's continue with the local level and uh, dive into our uh, Nordic VSR results and key learnings. And with us to do that uh, are, of course, our main partners in this endeavor. And those are the Nordic Local and Regional Government Associations. And we will start out with Anne Romsås, Chief Advisor at SDGs at the Norwegian Association. And you've also been a very uh, close partner in the editorial group for the, for the Nordic VSR. So Anne, take it away. Thank you so much, Olga. Is it on now? Yeah, now it's on. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I'm looking so forward to present some of the highlights from, uh, from this joint Nordic effort. And as we've heard today, this is actually the first cross-national report of its kind. So that's very exciting to get this platform at HLPF to actually so show what we have been working on. The aim of this review is to highlight how the Nordic municipalities have localized the SDGs, the progress they've made, as well as obstacles they have met in their work towards the 2030 agenda. But furthermore, we also aim to inspire more local level SDG action worldwide by sharing what Nordic local authorities have learned on their way to create more inclusive and sustainable communities and possibly foster new collaborative collaborations across borders and then arenas like HLPF are crucial. In this review, we also have included subchapters written by youth and civil society organizations. And these are really valuable contributions and you will hear more from them uh, later on today. I will now give you some highlights from our review. It is based on a survey across all Nordic municipalities and it is important for you to notice that there is a variety of response rates in that five countries that might affect some of our findings. And the survey in, uh, conducted in Denmark had a slightly different questions and will not appear in the following graphs, but in general, I can tell you that the Danish results are quite similar to the Norwegian results. And all the details for the curious ones of you are in the report, so I advise you to just dive into the report. But besides the survey, uh, content is also based on interviews with the, the local and uh, regional governments associations focusing on strengths and weaknesses in national support to the local level, including the role played by the organizations in building competence and fostering collaboration between municipalities. An important complement to the Nordic VSR is the Nordic Toolbox, an interactive online map of Nordic municipalities showcasing transferable methods and initiatives for implementing the SDGs. And the re review itself is full of local examples and cases, which we hope can inspire. So to the findings. What you see here is that the municipalities in the Nordic countries, they are truly working towards localizing the 2030 agenda and the SDGs. The majority are already working on it, while there's an average of 10% of municipalities that identify themselves as pioneers or frontrunners. But maybe there's a case of a typical Nordic modesty here. There's reason to believe that a larger number of municipalities should give themselves the credit of being pioneer or frontrunner. The next, the majority of responding municipalities have also integrated the agenda into several aspects of governance and administration. For instance, embedding SDGs into core documents such as local strategies and vision and the planning system. And quite surprisingly, a large number of municipalities also report that the SDGs are integrated into the local budgets and the procurement guidelines. And this was quite surprising for us, and I think that's an interesting message to also uh, dive more into. And we also see that there's a significant variation in how Nordic municipalities measure their progress towards the SDGs. While approximately 68% of municipalities in both Finland and Sweden report that they measure the progress, this figure is considerably lower in the other Nordic countries, uh, for Norway, 45%, 38% in Denmark, and just 18% in Iceland. And what we heard these last days here in HLPF is that access to data and the capacity to analyze is a challenge not only in the national level, but as we can see, it continues to affect the local SDG work. 
We also asked the question regarding the future of local SDG work. And we see that exogenous factors such as financial constraints caused by rising inflation and high energy prices may lead to a deprioritization of the 2030 agenda as immediate financial challenges demand attention and resources. And we see that from 68% of responding municipalities in Norway to 38% in Iceland, they view this as a considerable to high risk. And what we also found is that we saw some tendencies of SDG fatigue, especially at the national level and the politics that are being developed, and that, that influences the local level's um, ability to actually work with the SDGs. And, and we see that this message actually resonates with messages that we hear from our European colleagues and, and global colleagues. So, there is also some success factors to mention here, and also some challenges. And as you can see, they kind of mirror each other. We see that capacity is just a success factor, and, a, and also a, a huge barrier is a top challenge uh, to actually have the capacity to do the, to do the local work. Uh, and we also see that the importance of the political prioritization is uh, just uh, is, uh, a success factor and also a huge barrier. And as a barrier, it's assess, uh, especially the national level lack of prioritization that influences the local and regional governments. And we also see that the municipalities that are really good at anchoring the agenda in the management processes, in the administrations, like we showed during the planning system and the budget process, they also succeed in a lot of other factors and, and really are uh, mature when it comes to the SDG work. And we also see that lack of support from the states, lack of accessible uh, tools and methods are influencing the local work throughout the Nordics. So that was a short introduction to some of the findings, but there's, of course, a lot more to be found in the report itself and also in the toolbox. So, thank you. Thank you so much, Anne. <laughs> and that's what, that was the sneak peek yeah. into all the material that's <laughs> available here. All right, with us today, we also have Daniel Sasonov, Deputy Mayor of the City of Helsinki and also Chair of the uh, Kuntalito uh, Delegation to High Level Political Forum. That is the Finnish local regional uh, association. So very welcome here today. And let us know a bit more about the learnings for local level actors. Welcome. Good afternoon, everyone. And it's really great to be here. And it's really great to join you. And on behalf of the Finnish cities and municipalities, I want to thank all of you for the cooperation that has been made for this report. And from the perspective of Helsinki, which was the second city in the world completing the Valentini uh, review process. Uh, I'm really happy to see that this uh, idea of really monitoring actions on a local level have spread around Nordics and, and perhaps wi more widely. Uh, to summarize these uh, key learnings or recommendations, I have, I've clustered them or put them in uh, four baskets. And I I think that the first and perhaps the most important is the cooperation and sharing. And we see that learning, as we are now doing it from each other, is really uh, pushes us ourselves also forward in this work. And I was happy to see when I sat here that, for example, with our neighbor from, my neighbor from Reykjavik, we have been meeting two years ago in the city, Helsinki City Hall to discuss different kind of things that cities does, but also things that uh, really go in hand, in hand in hand with the uh, sustainable development goals. Uh, the other finding is that you really need a systemic approach to these things. Uh, a lot of recommendations there, uh, following indicators, uh, doing really this kind of reviews, putting uh, these actions inside your administrative management. They're really about the systemic approach and it's important to have that one. The third one uh, is uh, empowering community, uh, getting NGOs, different stakeholders, uh, young people, uh, universities, widely, more widely academia, uh, to join these efforts that we do in cities, in municipalities, in local governments, really uh, gives much more power than just cities or municipalities administ administration working alone. 
And last basket uh, or last point is perhaps the most important. It's that it's all about action. Here we say that dare to act global, but actually just widely it's about action, action and action. Planning is important, but actually action is the thing that uh, pushes the change forward. And I think as a city decision makers or, uh, or city officials, uh, one of the most important words for us is yes, because really often, especially perhaps in Nordic countries, at least in Finland, uh, we find different kind of obstacles uh, in different kind of uh, uh, approaches that NGOs or individual people or groups of people have. And I think that more important, we, more often we as a city politician and city administrations should say yes uh, and let communities let different actors do their best because that really pushes the change. But with these thoughts, uh, you can find more specific recommendations uh, in the report. I'm really happy uh, to be able to share this all with you. Thank you so much. Action, action, action. Over to you, Emil Broberg. You represent, you're a board member of the Swedish Association of Local Authorities and Regions, and you're also the councillor of the Östergötland region in Sweden. So, let us know some learnings for national level actors. Thank you, Osa. And uh, dear audience and colleagues from the Nordic countries, first I would like to thank you for a great collaboration between our organization in creating this report, and also, also give my appreciation to our national governments and our, uh, for co-hosting this event with us. As SDG, SDG 17 clearly states, it is through partnerships and knowledge sharing that we can achieve the sustainable development and goals in all countries at all levels. In the Nordic VSR, we share some key messages and learnings for the national level actors. Because even if we know that much of the change must come from the local level, we need to work together, not against the national level in our different countries. So this is what we learned from, from the report. Uh, most importantly, acknowledge our country's commitments to the SDGs and your role in the ongoing transition. This is crucial in challenging times and in times of SDG fatigue, as the national level plays an important role in guiding the nation. Secondly, I would say analyze your main sustainability challenges when forming policy. Use the SDGs as framework to create livable, attractive communities in your country. Monitor progress and report transparently. In doing this, it is important to maintain a holistic approach to sustainability and addressing the social, economic and environmental aspects of all policy proposals. Support local level action by recognizing the pivotal role played by municipalities and regions in driving the sustainability transition. Encourage systematic uh, engagement of youth, schools, and civil society. To facilitate local level action, support the development of local level indicators and rel reliable data collection data collection that can help local authorities measure progress towards SDG's achievement. Acknowledge and support the work of LRGAs in offering capacity building and peer learning to local authorities. Also consult regularly with the LRGAs on SDG relevant policy issues. I would also say that we need to continue funding national programs to support local SDG implementation through a multi-task holder approach. This should involve facilitating peer learning networks, funding mechanisms, and capacity building processes. For example, include innovation and SDG targets in public procurement guidelines as a means of advocating sustainable production and consumption goals. Lastly, let's take responsibility for the financial investment needed in the local level to mitigate and adapt to climate change and enable a sustainable transition together with local governments. If we are able to do this together, we are taking a huge step in our work to reach the common goals presented in the SDGs. Thank you.
Hilmi Stotter. You're the president of the Icelandic Association for Local Authorities. And uh, what's next? What would be the next steps, you think? You are on. Oh, now I'm on, yeah. Thank you, Osa, and thank you all who have been speaking uh, here today. Uh, the goal of this report was, of course, to take stock, not to boost, or, uh, but to guide us and inspire within the Nordic region and beyond. And I think the findings show that we have to accelerate the process. Uh, there are less than six years left, as we have heard many times here uh, these days, until 2030. And our review shows that we are on our way. We are doing progress, but we need to uh, boost this SDG work in our Nordic countries. Uh, some of you have mentioned fatigue. We see that in the report, and we have to get enlightened again, I think. So, uh, there are... Uh, we who are behind this review sincerely hope that the review and toolbox can encourage uh, municipalities and regions within the Nordic uh, region and beyond, because we think this is a good example about how uh, association or municipalities can work together with the national uh, authorities and others. Uh, and I think that uh, we can put more effort in the SDG work. And we hope it can also encourage national and international authorities and make them uh, more aware about the important role of municipalities and what, what we have, are doing in implementing the SDGs. And the need for national support to reach satisfactory results by 2030. There I'm talking not only about Iceland, <laughs> but we have been, uh, we have to do, do better there to measure. Uh, as we have heard many times, it's around 65% of the SDGs uh, depends on the local level, and we have to measure that so we know where we are standing. Uh, for us, uh, the Nordic Association of Local and Regional Authorities, the work on the review has been unique, cooperation, it's been learning experience for us, and it is my belief that we should build on this experience and cooperate more in the future. Uh, I also encourage other associations uh, of local and regional authorities to establish cooperation similar to this, because I think it's a huge uh, success for us, because we have learned so much during that time we have making, been making this. Uh, but this work would never have happened without the cooperation with Nordic Nordicio and uh, their experts and on behalf of the Nordic associations. I would like to thank Osa uh, Hildestrand and her team for their efforts and expertise uh, and of course the Nordic Council of Ministers for funding the project, which I think was really important. Uh, it has this work has taught us how to create joint ownership and responsibility for a sustainable future, and the toolbox is a great showcase of how we can copy with pride. And we encourage people to work together, visit each other, and, and work uh, on this together in the, in the future. Beyond, and I think this call to action also to collaborate between local regional government associations is really something to, to, to copy and copy with pride. And this brings us over to the Nordic Toolbox, which is the other, the sort of sister project, the other part of the Nordic VSR. This is an online uh, toolbox available via this uh, QR code on your, in the folder here. Uh, and you can navigate by filtering by SDGs or filter by topic and then learn uh, these uh, very practical hands-on examples from Nordic regions and municipalities on how to work with the SDGs in practice, day by day, uh, just to make it happen. And of course, copy with pride. That's what we do and that's what we hear from the most successful municipalities across the Nordics. That's what they do. That's how you, how you improve. Don't reinvent the wheel, never reinvent the wheel. We don't have time for that, right? 
And some people in this room, they, they really do. They walk the talk every day. And now I look at Sara and I look at so, Sara Sjödal, mayor of Tiarp municipality in Sweden, and together with Frida Jonsson, SDG strategist. Tiarp is a rural municipality of about 21,000 inhabitants, uh, a bit north of Stockholm. And you're presenting your first VLR this year. And you're with us today. And you're, of course, in the Nordic toolbox. So take it away. Thank you. Uh, first of all, it's an honor for us uh, and for TIA municipalities to be here. So that's, that's a great moment for us. Uh, we have two examples in this toolbox, and I will speak about one of them, and then I'll let over to Frida, so she will speak about the other one. Mm -hmm. And I start with a big one, this, the main part. Uh, we use uh, Agenda uh, 2030 uh, as our guiding framework for budget, municipal politics and activities. Uh, as you heard before, uh, it's a great tool to involve all of this. We have implicated Agenda 2030 through 77 local uh, sub-goals uh, uh, under the umbrella of uh, the SDGs. Uh, and the annual report gives uh, us an overview of uh, what has been achieved during the year and a good picture of the progress due to the 77 goals and in a holistic way also over the 17 global goals as our part of the local fulfillment of the agenda. To use Agenda 2030 as an overall framework for local goal setting is easy to say, but it's a very brave to do as a politician. Uh, and that's because in all our local reports and audits, you can follow the process and the status toward the SDGs. And we have done that for uh, about five years now. This transparency uh, shows clearly the, the gaps. And that makes an ex uh, expectations and that sets pressure on all of us local activity uh, politicians to closing the gaps. And we have to focus on global sustainable development instead of just our own main interests. And that's a big change uh, of the local perspective. And that makes a global contribution towards the SDGs. But it also makes uh, TIAP to a better and a good place to live and work in. So that's the concept of all this. And you can read more in this uh, toolbox about that one. Now, so as Sara said, we have been working on our own voluntary local review in the recent months, and it's full of many good examples from all of our, um, from all of our municipality and our different operations. And one of these examples in our VLR, it's also included in this Nordic toolbox. And it's about how we involve children and young people in our um, decisions, in our work. Uh, so we have been working in TIEP with citizens' dialogues for several years now, and we're quite successful, but we're not uh, so much worked with including the youth. So in the last uh, couple of years, we had a special focus on involving children and young people in our decisions. So the example in the Nordics toolbox, it comes from our work with Gold Free, Good Health and Wellbeing. So a major challenge in TIEP, and as we see it in other municipalities as well, is that mental illness among young uh, people has increased a lot. And instead of us uh, in the office trying to come up with the solutions, we decided that we turned turn directly to the young people themselves and ask them, um, ask them to come up with the solutions. And in this work, we choose to collaborate with a youth organization in Sweden. They're called Tilia. And they have developed a very good concept and method, a method for holding dialogues with young people. And it contains so, five steps that can easily be copied by other municipalities. And I don't have time to go through them in detail, but you can please read more about it in this toolbox. Uh, it consists of, of these five steps. Uh, so it's basically workshops in all the schools. We had the formation of a youth expert group. Uh, we compile a report with all the good ideas. And then we had meetings between young people and the policymakers. We also have a follow-up meeting to see the results. And several of the proposals were actually becoming a reality after just a few months. Um, so I know you will discuss this more later in the panel, but working with, with um, dialogues with citizens and especially with uh, young people has been really been a success factor for us when working with the uh, SDGs on local uh, level. So it's a greater chance of success if they are involved in designing the proposal that will affect 
affect them later. And it's also a question of democracy, of course. There are a large proportion of our population is, is you know, kids, is young people. Uh, and several of the, the ones who participated, they also said that uh, after uh, they were involved, they want to be more involved in the local community. And that was a really ni nice to see. So this was just one example from our VLR. We have several. So um, it's full of this concrete example on, on local action. So I encourage you all to, to look at it and also in this toolbox. It's a wonderful um, when you can spread the ideas um, uh, among Nordic countries, but also uh, globally, of course. So um, yeah, thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. We'll come back to youth engagement uh, very soon. But before that, we'll turn to uh, Mia Malin uh, and Senior Advisor, City of Helsinki. As we already heard from Daniel, you were one of the first cities in the world reporting a VLR, and you work a lot with SDG uh, governance. And uh, please, let us know what you put in the Nordic toolbox. Yes, thank you. Thank you so much, dear colleagues. And I want to thank the Nordic team for this great review. And I think this, this toolbox is really a great uh, addition for this, this review, because my experience is that in the, in the local level, uh, these kind of concrete tools uh, and methods are really important to go uh, and move forward to, to the actions. And uh, SDGs might seem a bit abstract sometimes in very local and uh, operational level. And now I want to highlight uh, one uh, example from the city of Helsinki. Uh, it's an ed educational model uh, called Kettu. Uh, Kettu means a fox, and it's a comprehensive educational initiative, and it's uh, including the environment and climate education, uh, insights for the circular economy, an understanding of the Agenda 2030 and uh, uh, future, uh, sustainable future uh, technologies and uh, trends. And uh, it's part of uh, the curriculum. And uh, in 2022, we started this in the early childhood education. Uh, we have trained over 1,000 uh, early childhood uh, education professionals and over 25,000 uh, children from uh, Helsinki have actively engaged uh, in the Get to activities throughout, uh, throughout the year. And uh, now uh, the model uh, will be spread to the elementary school. So this is one example you can find on this uh, toolbox. And then there is also example about our Six Cities Network for the strategic management of the SDGs, uh, which has been really important initiative for us in the city of Helsinki and other uh, bigger cities in Finland. And then there is also this kind of uh, Helsinki Culture Kid uh, program, uh, which is uh, offers uh, children and their families uh, access and opportunity to engage uh, in the city's art and culture uh, scene. So I think there is many important and interesting examples in this toolbox, and uh, I encourage you all to uh, uh, check it out and learn, learn more. Yes, thank you. a glimpse of the work, all the work. You have a lot more, of course, happening in Helsinki. We will leave the Nordic toolbox for now and, of course, still encourage you to take a look, closer look after this meeting and move over to the commentaries and the discussion. Because with us today, we also have some of our close international partners. Uh, so we're really eager to hear what you think stands out or what is missing in this Nordic VSR to uh, accelerate progress on the SDGs. Uh, so first, we wanted to welcome uh, Emilia Seiss, Secretary General of UCLG, the United Cities and Local Governments. You've worked for a long time to, uh, to uh, promote localization of the SDGs, let's put it that way. Emilia, we're so happy to have you here and to hear what you have to say about the Nordic VSR. The floor is yours. this audience and that is that a lot of the people here represent my board okay <laughs> and so the nordics play a very very important uh, role in the international municipal movement and i need to disclose that because otherwise it wouldn't be fair so giving you that context um, I, I i can also share with you that that i can be uh, really frank um, um about this and 
And, and I think in the usual way that Nordics deal with their own development, they are being quite prudent about what it implies to have a Nordic uh, uh, voluntary subnational uh, review. The, the first thing that has happened is that this joint vision has broken many rules about the approach to this development agenda. It has broken the glass uh, ceiling that separated the global north and the global south. It, it demonstrated that the sustainable development goals was an agenda for everyone. It doesn't matter where you come from. And, and that is groundbreaking. It, ch it changes the rules. It changes the way that people perceive this agenda. And this is the more important when we all acknowledge that this is indeed a very politicized agenda and that governments uh, like the ones in the Nordic countries have, al have allowed themselves to bypass that and to put trust in local governments of all colors to do this exercise, I think it's extremely relevant. So that, 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 those two are very important pieces. I am in very good company with OECD and, and, and UN Habitat, and obviously I'm somehow preaching to the choir um, in, in, this, in this gathering, uh, but we cannot stress enough how important the voluntary subnational reviews are to the overall movement. Of course, underpinned by the voluntary local reviews, and I'm so happy to have Helsinki here as, as one of the pioneers. It, it is one of the first things that we aimed at is when there was no local in the high-level political forum, we quickly moved toward that, and, and the support of these countries is extremely important. Okay. Well, what are those things that, that, that we are missing? Not, not that um, uh, we are missing it, what the world is missing. It, it's, it's something that comes out clearly in, in, the, uh, in the reports. It's just that there is not enough financial shift mm -hmm to uh, implement the sustainable development goals. And it doesn't matter in which country you are, that is a fact that everybody is talking about. The other important uh, part of this exercise, which I think is extremely, uh, is extremely relevant, is the acknowledgement of Nordic countries, that they are welfare states. And they say it with all the capital letters in there in the report. It's underpinned <laughs> in that social welfare state. And at the moment where other narratives are winning, saying that democracy and welfare are not that important, that equal opportunities are enough. I think this is also a game changer. And finally, a thought I want to, to leave with you. There is a whole movement of voluntary subnational reviews. That the, 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 tool, the Nordic toolbox is, is extremely important, but I think the role that is being given in this exercise to local government associations is extremely important because the international community has discovered cities but they have not totally understood what it is the system of cities that is driven and pushed by the local government association. And if there is something right now in this high-level political forum that demonstrates that has a role, it is through this, uh, through, this, uh, Nordic, um, through this Nordic experience. Still, we do need more investment, and I think that is something that we need to, um, to plea for. And, and, and probably, we will also need to acknowledge the value of exchanging uh, practices uh, with other local government associations. We have a small community of voluntary subnational reviews. Some of them are going to be presented throughout the week here. We are working this year with Costa Rica, with, uh, with Nepal, with South Africa, etc. And I think you have all win been an inspiration for that. I dare say. The voluntary subnational reviews and the involvement of Nordic countries and local and regional governments, in particular in this agenda, are to the development policy what the equality agenda was back up when I was growing up and trying to do something internationally. I think it is, it is a very, very significant step forward. And Shipra and I always say <laughs> that someday the whole high-level political forum is going to be not about voluntary national reviews, but about voluntary subnational reviews. That's, that's one of my secrets. I, I leave it there. I could go on forever. Thank you very much for this opportunity and count on United Cities and local governments to carry on this work with you and beyond.
much, Emilia, for those uh, very promising and very uh, you know, strong message moving forward with the local uh, and regional level taking a lead. Over now to Stefano Marta, your head of unit Smart and Sustainable Cities at the OECD. And we're, of course, also a strong partner uh, in this work. Please, welcome. Thank you, so much. Thank you so much for the invitation. And we were not part of the preparation of the VSR, but uh, we have been working in these uh, years with many cities and regions from uh, uh, Kopavogur in Iceland to southern Denmark uh, to uh, Viken, Akeshus now in, in Norway. So we know quite well the, the great work that uh, the Nordic local and regional government have been doing, and in particular the association. Uh, so in this brief intervention, just uh, a few key messages that are emerging from a survey that I think they are quite in line with the findings of that uh, Anne presented and also complementary that uh, from a survey that OECD, SDSN and the European Committee of Region conducted last year and we published in a report in March uh, of this year. Uh, so also from this survey, what is emerging is that uh, cities and regions are still working hard on the, on the SDGs, despite the SDG fatigue that we mentioned in particular at the national level. 40% uh, of the respondents to our survey told us that they were using the SDGs as a framework for policy making before the pandemic, and they are planning to do it even after the pandemic. And 25% 20, of the respondents told us that uh, they were not working on the SDGs before the pandemic, that, but they are planning to use it as a framework for the recovery after the COVID pandemic. Uh, still, there are many challenges that uh, are emerging in implementing the SDGs uh, at the local level. I would like to mention three of them. Uh, the first one uh, that is emerging is the lack of financial resources. And as Emilia just mentioned, is really a key, key obstacle. Uh, from our survey, 65% of the local and regional government told that this is the main challenge for implementing the SDGs. The second one is shifting political priorities, in particular after local and regional election, for more than 50% of the respondent. And the third one is insufficient vertical coordination between local and national government. Although there is some great example as in the Nordic countries, still this is a major challenge for uh, the localization of the SDGs. What to do about that? Uh, we develop a toolkit at OECD with some ideas on how these uh, challenges can be addressed. To address the financing challenge, uh, we are seeing that uh, local and regional government can use uh, earmark uh, taxes, they can use land value capture instrument to collect funding at the local level for the SDGs. Some uh, cities have been quite creative and they've been developing SDG bonds like the city of Kitakyushu in Japan to fund initiative on SDG localization. Some cities like Rotterdam in the Netherlands, they've been developing local investment crowdfunding instrument. And uh, uh, another very important tool is the SDG budgeting, as you also mentioned in your slide, Anne. And here we have, for example, the city of Strasbourg that was, is a very active one on this, but also Mannheim in Germany or some regions like the Basque Country have been using SDG budgeting uh, tools. The second one to address the shift in political priorities is really to mainstream the SDGs and ideas to mainstream the SDGs in local and regional development policy and strategy, and also to uh, to show, to document how the SDGs can help to address local development uh, challenges that the mayors, that the citizens are experiencing. Because this, uh, the idea is that to convince uh, politicians at the local level and the citizens that the SDGs are not an agenda on top of what they have to do daily, but that can be a framework to help them to address their local political priorities that they already have. So, it's a framework that can help us to promote synergies between different sectoral policy, to prioritize, to allocate budget, and so on. Last point, the one on um, the lack of vertical coordination. Here, the idea is really to strengthen multi-level governance. We have great example from uh, when Norway presented the VNR, for example, with the engagement of local government. Italy has done something very similar. Uh, Norway, Jap uh, Japan, and uh, Germany in uh, OECD countries, they also putting in place national framework uh, to support technically and financially their cities and the region to implement the SDGs. So strengthening multi-level governance is a key priority. Last message, a tool that is emerging and that could help also to uh, develop VNR, uh, VSR, and also perhaps to create some uh, harmonization between these tools is the artificial intelligence. And we have been discussing this with Cipra at the last OECD roundtable on cities and region for the SDGs. There are some studies that say that uh, AI may act as an enabler for 80% of the SDGs, 
but at the same time can also inhibit progress for 35% of the SDG target. So there is a lot of potential, but this should also be managed uh, carefully. Thank you again for the invitation and congratulations for the VSR. digital tools, AI, of course, one of them, but also already existing governance tools. That's also uh, many Nordic uh, municipalities use these uh, digital steering tools where the SDGs could just be uh, integrated and then you get your report by just using this digital tool. And, and that's, that's, of course, something we have to digitalize the SDG management in, in, in different ways. And TIRP is, of course, also already doing this and Helsinki and other cities in Europe. Thank you so much again. And now, last but not least, Shipra Narang Suri, your chief urban practices branch at UN Habitat. You're very familiar to many of the people in here and also senior advisor for SDG localization. We're extremely happy to have you here. So welcome. Thank you very much. Uh, sorry about my voice. Just got off a plane. This is a classic plain voice, um, but, but really great to be here, and, and many congratulations on the launch of, uh, of this report. Um, two, three things that, that struck me when I was looking at it, and not to repeat what, you know, sort of, uh, but to reinforce a little bit what, what both Stefano and Emilia have said. I think, I think the, the, the big thing that for me, comes out of this report is the enormous role of national national associations of local and regional governments, and the connection and the support that they get from their national governments to do something like this, which is a cross-border, cross-regional. Typically, voluntary subnational reviews are in a country, and here we have five countries cutting across, you know, um, the sort of national boundaries, five associations five national governments backing it. So I think this this itself as a process, this is the kind of this is the kind of shift in thinking we need if we are to achieve the SDGs at scale. We're not going to be able to achieve them community by community, city by city, municipality by municipality. This is the kind of kind of um, shift that we and collective action that we need. But the other thing that um, that strikes me, and that's a question that that many times we've asked asked ourselves, and many others around the world have asked, what is this sort of Nordic formula that we talk about? The formula for success, the formula for pursuit of sustainable development, inclusive development, and I think um, certainly the multi-level governance piece is important, as as Stefano was saying. But I think multi-level governance combined with this multi sectoral integration, the holistic approach that you were talking about just now in the toolbox, um, as well as the multi-stakeholder engagement, which is now exemplified also in the youth and civil society voices. Very often you find one or two of those factors working. You don't find all three axes working at the same time. And I think that to me is, is something that, that really stands out. So it's, it's a bit of an all-in sort of ownership across these, these axes. Um, the systemic integration, mainstreaming that we were talking about, what discourages local governments typically, also in other parts of the world, uh, from embracing the SDGs is that they feel it's something more. Mm. It adds on the burden of collecting new data, the burden of reporting on new things, the burden of of uh, you know starting to structure their budgets differently or starting to to modify their plans i think this this persuasion and this this uh, great example of mainstreaming and saying that this is actually a better way of doing what you're doing already and will find resonance in other parts of the world so you can share more you can engage more that this is not an optional or an add-on or an extra, but really it's a different lens, and that's all it is. I think that's, that's to me, um, very, very important. I was quite struck by the youth piece. I think uh, we, are, we at Habitat are trying to develop, we have developed a Youth 2030 scorecard, and we're trying to develop guidance on youth-led VLRs, so we would be very happy to see you know, how we can integrate some of your, your work into that. Um, 
Also, I think this idea and this this uh, part of the Nordic formula that that I that that we can talk about is also this openness to learning and sharing, learning from mistakes, not hesitating to share what didn't go so well. We've had several rounds of discussions with Helsinki with others. You know what was the first VLR like? What was the second one like? What was the third one like? And I think there's a lot of willingness to engage and to learn. Um, and to and to share what goes well as well as what doesn't. But you're not alone in this exercise. And what I want to close with is that a lot of these messages actually resonate with other parts of the world. What you and Habitat is seeing, UCLG is seeing, um, with many other parts of the world. The lack of capacity, the lack of data, the lack of uh, fiscal decentralization that you talked about, the financial shift, is a, is a very global issue. And I think we need to find real solutions um, to that. Um, there is a global movement on VLRs which has grown over the past several, you know, several years. But local action is still seen as peripheral to global agendas. Global agendas are set. And then we try and plug in local action to implement those global agendas. Another one of our joint dreams is that the post-2030 agenda is constructed fully in a bottom-up manner rather than in a top-down manner, and then asked, you know, transmitted to local and regional governments to implement. That cannot be. We've made that mistake in the Agenda 21. We've made that mistake in the MDGs. We've made that mistake in the SDGs. We cannot have that happen in the post-2030 agenda. And that is something that I think collectively this movement, the people in this room, need to push uh, forward towards. Again, a very big thanks and uh, a very, very big commitment from our side to continue working with you. Thank you. That was another set of really inspiring words. And uh, last but not least, our youth delegates from the Nordic countries. So we still have, have time for your voices. We have the youth chapter in here. Uh, there is, again, no need to reinvent the wheel. There is a lot of good youth engagement happening in the Nordic countries. Uh, with us here today, uh, to begin, is Ari Sigurdarsson, Norway's youth delegate to the UN. And what is youth washing, really? And why is that a problem in relation to the SDG? Ari, the floor is yours. Thank you so much for uh, letting me be here and thank you for letting me contribute to the report. It's been a pleasure. And as my name might reveal, I'm a child of uh, not one but two nations. I'm also Icelandic. So throughout my whole life has been uh, focused on comparing and learning from my two countries and seeing how we're different but also very much similar. And youth washing, like you were asking about, is kind of similar as the concept to greenwashing. It's about pretending to involve youth in decision-making processes without giving them the real influence and power to properly participate in a meaningful way. And despite the Nordic region's progressive reputation, I have felt myself, and in also in the making of this part of the VSR talk with Norwegian youth councils, both municipal and regional, that this is an issue. Youth voices are often tokenized. Structural barriers like limited access to decision-making, insufficient resources, and lack of political will hinders genuine involvement. But there are important measures already in place. Having programs such as the UN Youth Delegates Program that we have in Norway, and a lot of other countries have, I see my colleagues there from Iceland, from Finland, from Ireland, from Malta, from, I mean, we're a lot of people here and we are in the room and we want to contribute. And this is a clear way of ensuring the youth are given the opportunities to participate and engage in a meaningful way. It is crucial that even when governments change and financial priorities can be difficult, the funding for youth participation, such as in the States, UN delegations are not cut such as we're unfortunately seeing happening also in the Nordic countries. And this brings me to my final point. While our adult counterparts must ensure that we, the youth, are given meaningful opportunities to participate, we must also demonstrate our ability and our eagerness to contribute and to engage. 
It is also so important that when we are given the opportunity to participate that we do not use up our time only speaking about the importance of youth participation, but also allocate enough time to matters that are equally as important. It seems maybe kind of like obvious, but we use up a lot of our time speaking about why we should be here and not why we're contributing, showcasing that we're contributing as well and that we have ideas we want to talk about financing for development, sexual and reproductive health and rights, and biodiversity loss, among others. We do not only want to talk about youth participation. <laughs> and if we, both adults and youth, can share the responsibility of talking about meaningful youth participation in our speeches and our work, the youth will not have to use up their limited speaking time only on this matter. Our State Secretary, Björk Sandstad, who I'm glad will be joining the Norwegian delegation next week, showcased this beautifully in her speech in the general debate of the Commission on Population and Development two months ago, speaking about the importance of youth participation. I was really touched by that because she used a minute of her time speaking about me. I was seen in that speech. And we, the youth, and I'm looking at the youth delegates, we need to show that we're ready to contribute, that we're ready to bring innovative ideas and actively participate in shaping the decisions that affect our future. And by doing so, we can prove that our involvement is no, not only necessary, that we need to have a seat at the table, but that we also are valuable, that we're an, we're an asset. And by that, I want to thank everyone for listening in. And yeah, over to my fellow youth delegates. Thank you so much. And obviously, in this report, there are clear examples of how and why it's so important to, to work systematically with youth engagement, to, to have youth contribute at the local level, to find, co-create these solutions to create the green transition and, and social inclusion. And you know much more about this, Carolina Vakanen. You are chair of the UN Youth of Finland, and very welcome here today. Soon. All right. <laughs> thank you so much, and uh, thank you for the question and the chance to comment. Um, uh, first of all, I applaud you and congratulate you on the VSR, first ever of its kind, as mentioned here already earlier. Um, this is indeed a great example, yet again, of our Nordic family, as also mentioned here, but I still <laughs> wanted to highlight it in the end. Um, especially as a youth delegate, I warmly welcome the inclusion of young people in compiling this report, and especially my colleague back in Finland, Antti Rekelin, who was in the network with you guys. But echoing what Eri Ari said here, um, still have to highlight the importance of participation and the structures needed for that. Um, and in the Nordic Youth Network, part of this, uh, this review, um, we use the words meaningful and real youth participation. Not only meaningful, we've used to hear meaningful only, but the real part of it is the one that I also want to highlight here today. Um, but structures are needed for that. We are not meaningfully engaging or part participating without structures. I've compiled three main remarks that I'd like to share with you all today. Firstly, young people need structures, as mentioned, channels of participation that are supported by both local and national governments. Here in HLBF, I am representing the Agenda 2030 Youth Group. It is a national level youth group working alongside the Prime Minister's Office and the Commission on Sustainable Development. Although we are on the national level, we are still scaling down to local levels as our members act as drivers for change on their local contacts as well. By providing young people across Finland the opportunity to take part in our work, our impacts are felt and seen in local levels. When structures such as youth groups and councils are provided, young people can act as enablers and drivers of change, globally, as we used the word here earlier. Secondly, structures like youth groups or the youth councils working alongside the local decision makers are important tools to include youth voices in the decision making concerning sustainability for generations to come, not only here today or tomorrow or next week in HLPF, but for years to come. However, just a seat at the table, as Ari here described as well, is not enough. The seat at the table does not guarantee that we, the young people, are treated as equal in dialogue and policymaking. Thus, I want to remind everyone here present, both the youth delegates and others as well, 
that enabling meaningful youth engagement and participation is not merely the responsibility of us young people, but first and foremost of those who hold the power. So looking at all of you guys here. <laughs> <laughs> Empowering young people and providing opportunities to make an impact is not zero-sum game. You benefit from it too. Lastly, I want to remind all of us here that these kinds of participatory structures do not come without the price. The price, mostly paid by the young people acting as volunteers, mm -hmm. is not a sustainable one. Hence, support to young people and their initiatives in multiple forms, ranging from financing to creating safer and more accessible spaces, is key in enabling meaningful and real youth participation. In order to succeed in implementing the SDGs, young people need to be included. So, lastly, lastly, <laughs> I encourage every listener here today to act as an advocate for these kind of participation structures and continue to support young people. For the young here, I dare you, demand the space that you deserve. Thank you. Thank you so much, Carolina. And again, I think it's, there's a lot to learn from these systematic approaches that we see. And actually, in, in at least three of the Nordic countries, it's, it's, uh, it's mandatory by law to, for local governments to set up a youth council. But then, of course, again, it's, it's also a matter of not just youth washing uh, that council, but, but actually listening to them and involve them in your policy development. And then miracles can happen. And the attractivity of the municipality can increase. And all sorts of things can happen. So wonderful. Wonderful. Sara Julia Balvinsdottir, you're Iceland's UN delegate uh, on sustainable development. And why is education so important in this context? Thank you, Asa, and thank you to my colleagues for their great words on, on impactful youth participation. Um, and thank you to Asa for, for having us participate in the VSR process. Uh, I wanted to highlight, uh, separate from the arguing about our... our um, participation in our seat at the table, I wanted to, to go beyond and, and I want to talk about education and how important that is when it comes to the sustainable development. And looking at sustainable development from a local level, I think it's evident to discuss uh, education as thanks to mandatory public and primary and lower secondary education in the Nordics. Uh, municipal policymakers can directly impact all youth through the educational system. Uh, and we know that education plays an, an essential role when it comes to reaching the SDGs. Uh, and we have the goal number four on quality education, but we also have the uh, goal 4.7, the target 4.7 on, on the education on sustainable development, which highlights the importance of accusation of the, of the knowledge and skill necessary to promote sustainable development. Uh, and, and with this education, we are... Um, increasing global awareness, we are building critical and technical skills, uh, we are promoting uh, equity and inclusion and, and sustainable lifestyles, and preparing youth with the tools and the confidence needed uh, for imp impactful um, participation. And we're planting the seed of, of the way we think and, and, and the way we are going to be continue living on this, on this earth. Um, and I wanted to um, talk about a little bit about the report done by for the Nordic Council of Ministers in 2021, where the uh, implementation of goal number 4.7 in compulsory education in Nordics was, um, was explored, uh, and, and, the, and the goal was to uh, receive an overview of how well uh, each of the Nordic countries have uh, integrated the UN uh, SDGs into their educational policies and practices, and unfortunately the results were not too positive. Um, I think maybe this is a sign for us to maybe rethink the way we spend our time in the classroom and, and hearing about the great examples from, from Frida in, in, in Sweden and, and how we can uh, use the time that we have with our youth and, and hear their voices in an impactful way. I think this is a, an important lesson to learn uh, and, uh, and it's great to hear that this encourages further cooperation in the future. Um, I think if we want to increase impact youth, impactful youth participation, we need to create the space within the classroom um, uh, to take an active part in projects where we are an important stakeholder. 
uh, for example, Youth Concert and other platforms, what we talk about sometimes today as informal education, which I think is a little bit vague uh, term for this super important uh, and impactful learning that we are, we're gathering from, from these platforms. Um, and I think if we want to continue to be front runners when it comes to education, I think this is an important um, topic that we need to continue to integrate into our education. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sara Julia. And I think with those words, we also actually come, come to a, a closure of uh, the commentary to this report. Uh, we have run over time a little bit, but not too bad in UN context, right? <laughs> so, so if you have time and want to ask a question or comment on the commentaries and uh, the content, I would say that, that uh, I'll, I'll give you a few minutes to do that. And you're very welcome to just raise your hand. We have someone here in the back. I don't know if you could just move forward and grab a microphone there. Uh, thank you. Uh, yeah, my name is Rajan Foster. Uh, I just graduated from high school. I'm 18. I represent the Global Collab Network. Uh, I just wanted to ask, as someone whose goals are to kind of, I'm going into AI, I want to develop a model that is kind of reshaping urban development in la, less like LDCs. Earlier in the panel, we talked about like the Nordic model and all these kind of reasons why Norway is succeeding in all these, sorry, the Nordic countries are succeeding in all these ways. How do we implement those kind of processes into LDCs where the finances aren't so stable, the government doesn't have necessarily as sound of procedures and multinational systems that we've talked about what are the first steps for implementing those kind of things? I want to give some, some ideas to this, but otherwise I would also look at our international partners over here, because you're doing this on a daily basis, we hope. So, uh, <laughs> although it is a delicate question about transferring funds from, uh, from richer to poor, and of course transferring capacity as well. I think capacity building at the local levels is extremely important here. So, but maybe, I don't know, do you want to comment on this? No, not. not necessarily. <laughs> Please, Emilia and then Shirpa. Yeah, let, let me take that one. It's, it's a tough one, as it usually is, eh, from, um, from, uh, from youth. Um, I, I, I would say, of course, it is about capacity building um, and enhancing the governance capacity and, and transparency models, etc. But there is also something that I think, in particular, your generation will need to do better than we have done. And that is acknowledging that there is a global model of development that will need to change, and there needs to come a social justice model that will allow least developed countries to um, uh, access financial markets and access uh, production markets um, in a different way than they are able to do it now. The financial institutions of the future cannot possibly look like the ones they do today because then least developed countries will not be able to advance. And I think in any model, in, in, in any, um, in any, in any part of artificial intelligence and progress that we would like to, uh, to support countries with, we need to ensure that inequality is no longer part of the algorithm and equation that allows our societies to thrive. So I think um, that, that is very important for you to take into account in, in your future endeavors. And, and I think that through development cooperation, through city-to-city -city learning, uh, we, we are coming to understand that and big discussions around loss and damage. And the next step following the summit of the future and this famous annex on future generations um, will need to take us uh, there. And, and I, I do hope that you do better than we have done. Thank you. Shipra, would you like to continue on this one? Just building on what, uh, what Amelia was saying, I think two things. One is the 
the international financial architecture needs to shift, but it also needs to shift vertically. There are too many barriers for cities, local governments, as well as local communities to access the finance they need for development. So, you know, one is the, the shift towards the LDCs and, and the other is the shift downwards from, you know, from national uh, to local. But the other thing is that we also have to recognize that much as we think about technology, AI, and other, other technological solutions towards sustainable development and transformation and equality, 50% of the world is still offline. Half of the world does not have access to those technological tools. And again, there also, you really need to start from you know, the basics. Start by, by enhancing access. Mm to broadband internet, to technology, to digital tools. All of these digital tools are useless to 50% of the world if they don't have access to broadband, for example. Um, and, and my last point is really about every change happens sort of in a step-by-step -step way. I don't think the Nordic cities and countries we are talking about arrived at this overnight. So I think really we, there is a lot to share in terms of the journey that cities and countries have undertaken and what have been the steps in those journeys. And, and we realize that there is a lot more in common across continents than what is different. So just to say that there is, there is, a, there is a lot to do, but there is a step-by-step -step process that we need to go through. Thanks. The question as well, and I think, uh, yeah, we also we're all humble uh, with this big daunting task of doing this transition. But we also see that the power of peer-to-peer -peer learning, copy with pride, and we also see a lot of examples of twinning between cities. And uh, looking at Helsinki, for example, I know you've done such work, and other cities uh, in the Nordics as well, together with cities in Latin America, in Africa, and other continents. And I think that's of course also a way forward. And then we really end up with peer-to-peer -peer learning because there are some of, of, of many similar issues that occur. But as, uh, that said, of course, technology also needs to be accessible to more people around the globe. Uh, another final question from the lady in the back. Do you want to use my microphone? Um, I can try to say thank you so it's, much. It's good for the recording. Oh, yeah. Thank you, please. Thank you so much. The reason I'm sitting at the back is I injured my back this morning. I slipped off. Oh, <laughs> um, sorry to hear this. Um, I'm Yug Ratna and one of the two organizing partners for the major group for children and youth, which is the constituency that facilitates children and youth engagement at the HLPF. You might have heard some of our colleagues um, speaking during the sessions. And I wanted to come in on the question asked by the Global Collab um, person there. Uh, I think there are some really good examples that can be highlighted when it comes to how NCM um, and its member countries have supported youth engagement. So starting from this year, um, CEDA recently provided a grant to Asia-Pacific Youth to organize a convening on Summit of the Future that will take place in September, actually, in Kuala Lumpur. And in lead up to that, the young people are organizing their own sort of national processes on feeding into Summit of the Future and how to take inputs and do that. So that is a very um, recent example that we have seen, and it is channeled through Major Group and through another regional women organization in Asia. Another very good example is what happened during the Stockholm Plus 50 conference in which another Nordic Council of Ministers Finland and Sweden were the actually three major donors, um, which I was coordinating back in 2022. Um, and in lead up to Stockholm Plus 50, there was a way for young people to host consultations, and more than 60 decentralized consultations were hosted, like in different parts of the world, whether those were countries, online, uh, on the ground, uh, virtually, and that allowed uh, young people that are sometimes traditionally not able to engage with the governments, especially if you look at um, developing economies or countries that do not have that structure of engagement with civil society, they were still able to engage with the local actors or other actors within their country and development uh, framework. So I just wanted to chip in on that. Thank you. Thank you so much. And I think that's a perfect uh, closing of this event where we also wanted to highlight the importance of youth and youth engagement in so many ways. And of course, I'm sure that youth will eventually solve all this because they're much smarter than we are and they have the digital, all the digital tools at their hands. And you have a global mindset that we've often lacked. Maybe not the people in this room, but anyways, in general. So uh, let's hope that we can see a world where we can use the SDGs as a way to focus on 
increasing quality of life and you know, beyond political polarization. And with that, thank you so much to our fantastic, fabulous, uh, distinguished speakers with us today, taking your time to also give us feedback on this report that we've worked on for quite some time. And I also want to reach out to my colleagues here in the room who've, who've, who've made this all happen. Uh, so it's a celebratory movement, uh, moment and a movement forward. Action, 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 right, Daniel? Together, and thank you all. <laughs>